Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. I'm Carla Rothlin, and I'm here today with one of our co-organizers, Matteo Iannacone. But before Matteo introduces our global immuno speaker today, I would like to just make a very brief announcement, which relates to our true goal of being global. So we are going global live next week. So please note that our next global immuno talk by Dr. Shalin Naik will go live on Wednesday at 4 p.m. Australian time. But for those of you that always join us at this time, do not worry because this talk will be available again in this same webinar at the regular time. So looking forward to connecting with more global immuno colleagues around the world as of next week. So thanks for joining and Matteo, the forum is all yours. Thank you very much, Carla. And on behalf of all the organizers, uh, I'm excited to introduce uh, my friend uh, Wolfgang Kastenmüller as today's global immuno speaker. Uh, Wolfgang was born and raised in Germany, where he obtained his uh, medical doctor degree as well as his board certification in microbiology. Uh, he then moved to the NIH uh, for postdoctoral training, where he joined the laboratory of Ron Germain who gave an Immuno talk previously, and I believe Wolfgang is actually the third trainee uh, from Ron's lab to give a global Immuno talk after uh, Caetano Reyes Sosa and Hai Chi. Um, uh, Wolfgang had an extremely productive period in Ron's lab. Uh, he used imaging to study how lymph nodes provide the microenvironment to support adaptive cellular immunity. And he published a series of papers looking at the uh, functional significance of um, uh, cellular positioning and uh, local intercellular communication within lymph nodes, uh, defining the antiviral law, role and dynamics of um, uh, innate lymphocytes, um, as well as uh, memory T cells. Um, he was then recruited as an associate professor at the University of Bonn in Germany. And in his own lab, Wolfgang uh, continued some lines of investigation that he um, established in Ron's lab. And in particular, uh, he uh, delineated the uh, complex choreography of uh, uh, cellular interactions uh, underlying uh, effective uh, cell-mediated antiviral responses, uh, focusing in particular on the role of uh, plasmocytoid dendritic cells, as well as um, of uh, different subsets of conventional dendritic cells. In 2017, he was recruited as a full professor and chair of the newly founded Institute of Systems Immunology at the University of Würzburg. And there he discovered that the uh, transcriptional regulator BADF3, long known for its role in dendritic cells, is also a lethal intrinsic factor mediative, uh, effective, mediating effective responses. And I'm sure we will hear more about this uh, today, as well as uh, about Wolfgang's uh, latest uh, research directions. Now, in recognition of his work, Wolfgang has received numerous prizes and, and awards, including an ERC consolidator grant. And Wolfgang is a highly creative scientist, so we are really grateful that he has accepted uh, our invitation to speak today. Thanks, Wolfgang. Yeah, thanks a lot for this very kind introduction, Matteo. I'm really, uh, it's really very nice. And uh, I really think it's a fantastic seminar series, and uh, I feel very honored to be part of it. So uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. Our pleasure, uh, Wolfgang. So, as you know, one tradition of these uh, global immuno talks is that we ask speakers uh, one question uh, to get to know them a little better. And the question we would like to ask you is, how does uh, technology inspire your research? Well, for me, really one of the reasons why I joined Ron's lab because I was interested in imaging and to, to make use of this technology to understand more of the research questions um, that we had or that I had at the time. And I think that really inspired me a lot because it's not only that you generate fantastic images, but it really changes the understanding of certain biological processes. So that is really something that I really liked a lot. And I think now with um, the onset of new technologies that allow us to combine really single cell sequencing together with imaging, you know, to have the full spectrum of understanding cells in the tissue, I think it's going to be really exciting in the future. Yeah, that's great. That rings very true. Yeah. Thanks, Wolfgang. So uh, without any further ado, uh, Wolfgang, if you want to uh, share your screen, we all look forward to your talk. All right. All right. Um, so 
thanks again for listening. So today, um, I think the last two decades or even more than that, uh, the view of how we think about the immune system has changed quite dramatically. Um, and basically from the idea that the immune system is particularly important for pathogen defense, it has evolved to, to a concept that uh, it's important for healing, for development, for self-tolerance, for many diverse functions. And I think one way to summarize these functions is to think of the idea that the immune system actually serves every organism to maintain this individuality. And I really like uh, this idea because actually the, 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 the elements of the immune system, the cellular elements, the T and B cell lymphocytes, or these large fractions of the uh, immune system, themselves represent individual cells that can be discriminated by their TCR. So individuality actually comes with a certain price. You know, and this is a picture which is almost seems from a, from a different world after one year of COVID. But imagine this is you, and now you need to find your perfect matching partner. He seems very close, but it's still very difficult to actually reach him. And imagine now you're on the party and you want to, to celebrate. How do you, once you have found your partner, how do you get into your friends? How do you get into uh, the whole party business? And that's exactly a problem that's in fact very similar in the immune response. So here we're looking. Yeah, not moving. Oh, it's not moving. Okay. Um, okay. I just heard, sorry that the slides are not moving. I had this problem before. Okay. Matteo, can you tell me whether they're moving now? No. They don't seem to be moving, Wolfgang. Nothing moving? Mm -mm. Okay. okay. Perhaps stop sharing and yeah, share again, I'll maybe. Try this. Okay. So let me try this again. Um, is uh, anything moving? We no, no don't we don't see anything. the presentation anymore. Okay. Good. Sorry. Let's try no again. Take your time, Wolfgang. Can you see any slides now? No. 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 Okay. Hmm. Are you sharing the desktop, Wolfgang, or the application? Um, I actually think I'm sharing the application. So let me just quickly close the application. Okay. Otherwise, you can try sharing the desktop if you're putting in presentation mode. And sometimes this works. Okay. So I'll try, um, I'll try the desktop. Okay. Yes. Yeah, we can see it now. And let's see if they move. So does now things move? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, now it moves. Okay, see. good. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Finally, understanding technology. <laughs> so, sorry, let me start again. But um, I think the, the idea of the immune system you know, protecting you as an individual um, that I don't want to repeat now, but I think this image I still want to show you again because I really think it illustrates the problem of being an individual and finding a partner. So let's imagine that's you and here is your partner that you want to find. You can imagine it's quite complicated or so he seems so close and uh, once you found him you still want to get things going. And this is, as I indicated, very similar to the problem you may serve as a lymphocyte and the lymph node because the environment is densely packed and you have to find your way through to identify your partner. And once you've done that, you want to initiate an immune response. All right, so let me quickly review the organization of a lymph node. So if we split this up, we know that in the paracortex, um, we have, um, um, uh, so this is the paracortex, but we find CD4 and CD80 lymphocytes. We have um, B cells, which are organized in B cell follicles. All these lymphocytes are encased in a layer of macrophages. And these macrophages are strategically positioned within the lymphatic sinuses of the medulla and the subcapsular sinus. And they are positioned there so they have perfect access for any pathogens that may be delivered from the, uh, from the lymph from peripheral tissues so that it can scavenge them and can fight them. 
when we do intravital microscopy, the typical uh, field of view that we have is about this area in the interfibular area, at least when we image T cells, which we, what, what we are doing. Um, so the movies you will be seeing will be actually a representation of this uh, field of view. So here we have um, such an uh, intravital microscopy picture. So here we transferred a lot of T cells. So we changed the ratio of individuality. And uh, when we see how the cells are moving, and this is now starting about one hour after we infected the mice in the skin with vaccinia virus, the vaccinia virus drains to the lymph node, it infects dendritic cells, and the T cells that are present can efficiently find the infected dendritic cells. And once they've done so, they will stop migrating, they interact, and they get primed. And you can see by about um, four hours um, after infection, already the majority of cells that have been in that field of view, so in the interfollicular area between the two follicles, have found um, their partner and are interacting. So as I said, in the middle of the cluster is a dendritic cell. In our case with vaccine virus, it's an infected dendritic cell and the T cells are interacting with it. So what we have been interested in is what other cells are contributing to this interaction and, um, and how are they recruited. In particular, we have been interested initially in plasmocytoid dendritic cells and the idea that they could deliver important cytokines like interferon type 1 and also CD4 helper T cells, which are important to mediate helper signals to CD8 T cells. So let's start with plasmocytoid dendritic cells. Now in this case, the movie has switched color so the PDCs are now green and the T cells are red. In the steady state, in the intrafocular area, PDCs, just like T cells, migrate around pretty randomly. Um, nothing too exciting about this. But once we activate the system, once we put in a virus in the skin, again, we see activation of T cells. The T cells will cluster um, around an infected dendritic cell that you cannot see here, conventional dendritic cell that's in the middle. But the PDCs seem to gather around um, the cluster of T cells and seem to interact with them. So uh, changing really the local environment of the priming site. Now, uh, when we look at cross sections, I think this becomes even clearer. So here is now a cross section of a lymph node about eight hours after infection. We see the B cell follicles in blue. We see the PDCs in green and they are surrounded, surrounding C the CD8 T cell clusters, as you can see here. So quite a dramatic change of the localization of the plasma site with dendritic cells. Now, this change in organization is not only true for PDCs, but within the same time frame, so about eight hours, also true for CDC1s, as identified here with the report of mice for X year one. So this is how it looks like in the steady state. That's a lymph node, a non-affected situation, CD8 T cells. When we infect and wait about eight hours later, the T cells form the clusters, and around the clusters from the T cells, again, we find the accumulation of CDC1s. So not only the PDC network has been altered, but also the conventional dendritic cell network has been rearranged shortly after infection. So why is this happening? And how is this happening? Oh, sorry, first I want to show you the dynamic movie of this. So here's the uh, T cell clusters, and here's how it looks like dynamically. So also the, the conventional CDC1s really form this very dynamic network about the activated CD8 T cells and what's not shown here is now the PDCs that we also have to imagine are part of this um, really um, newly developed um, environment. So how is it working? Um, this is just some uh, data taken from Imgen. So one of the most abandoned transcripts that T cells produce upon activation are chemokines like CCL3, CCL4, the ligands for CCR5. And this is how PDCs are recruited and XL1, the ligand for XCR1, and this is how T cells recruit CDC1s. So it's really the T cells which upon activation change uh, the environment or, the, or change the network of dendritic cells and, and recruit them to the activation site. And now before I explain um, uh, why this is important, I would just take a small detour and talk about CD4 help. You know that um, CD4 help is not only important for B cells, but it's also important for CD8 T cells. In the context of a viral infection, this effect of CD4 help cell, T cell help is often not apparent in the primary infection, but when you do a recall infection, now you find that the T cells that did not receive help during the primary um, activation 
they fail to mount a robust recall response. Now, in contrast to B cells, CD4 T cells don't mediate help to CD8 T cells directly, but via proxy, and that's the dendritic cell. So we know that CD4 T cells activate dendritic cells primarily via CD4 D ligand interaction, so it's called licensing. And now these superactivated dendritic cells can uh, perfectly prime CD8 T cells or activate them, and the critical signal seems to be CD7 T, CD27 interactions. And the important bit here is that CD4 help is mediated by a dendritic cell, and CD8 and CD4 T cells need to talk to the same dendritic cell. So we wanted to know when does this interaction with the same DC take place and where on on which DC platform. And just to mention here, CD4 T cell help is in fact particularly important in the context of cancer um, immunotherapy. Um, okay, so here's again a movie. Here we look at the CD8 T cell clusters you have seen before. Here we have antigen specific CD4 T cells in green and non-specific CD4 T cells in blue. And when we run the movie, you can see that the CD8 T cells are nicely arrested around the CDC that you cannot see now, but the CD4 T cells don't seem to pay attention to CD8 T cells or to the DC that is activating CD8 T cells. Now this is quite an early time point, about three hours. So what happens a bit later? So we looked at about eight hours or 10 hours here. Now you can see that CD8 T cells are still forming clusters, but CD4 T cells form their own cluster here and it don't seem to be mixed with CD8 T cells. So really, in, in context of this infection, CD8s and CD4 T cells seem to be activated separately by different APCs. And this is not only true for vaccinia virus, but others have shown that this is also true, for example, in the context of herpes simplex virus infections. Okay, so now we have um, kind of a problem, right? Because we know that they have to talk to the same DC, but they activate it on separate DCs. So when do they come together? So we looked a bit later, and now it's 24 hours, so it's after the initial priming phase to 48 hours. And now we find that indeed we see co-cluster of CD8 and CD4 T cells, but now they're not in the interfollicular area, but much deeper in the paracortex. And these co-clusters were always associated with CDC1. Now, when we depleted CDC1s, we could still find cluster, but now they would be separated again, arguing that indeed CDC1s are critical to link CD4 help for CD8 T cells. Now let me summarize this in a model. Um, in our system, using vaccinia virus, virus can easily drain from the periphery to the lymph node where it infects dendritic cells. Dendritic cells present antigen and activate CD8 T cells. Now this first step may be very different between different uh, experimental models that you have that depend on the virus system that you use. This could be a migratory DC, this could be an infected and uninfected DC, a CDC1 or CDC2. Whatever dendritic cell carries the antigen will activate the CD8 T cell. Now what's happening after that is now a very generic thing because once T cells get activated, they produce tons of chemokines like CCL3, CCL4 and XCL1. And this now leads to recruitment of these various dendritic cells creating a new network. Originally we thought, that this network is important to support the initial priming process of CD8 T cells. But this turned out to be not the case. Indeed, this network is developing in order to transmit information to CDC1s that have been recruited in form of inflammatory signals and also in form of antigen. Now, these CDC1s rapidly mature, they translocate to the deep paracortex, and now they form a second platform to again activate CD8 T cells and link CD4 T C cell help to those CD8 T cells. Now, currently we are trying to look at this network dynamically. It's a bit challenging because it's much more deep in the lymph node, but we're excited, quite excited about the initial results that we have received. Um, so what I've been showing you is that in the context of a viral infection, T cells expand, contract, and form a memory. But it turns out that signal, signals very early on after infection like CD4 help or other signals are important and have an impact later on on the quality and the quantity of the memory response. So we wanted to know what molecular signals could be important that imprint T cells early on and regulate the memory response later on. And this project has been tackled by my first PhD student in the lab, Carl Commander, 
and then continued by my first postdoc at the lab, Marco Adagia. So they, these two have been looking into AP1 family and AP1 is actually a collective term for a lot of different um, effectors. And these factors form heterodimers and as a heterodimer, they can drive transcription. Other heterodimers, like for example, um, C. June and families of the, of the BAT family, BAT F family, like C. June and BAT F or BAT F3, um, act as transcription repressors. And you may know about BAT F3 because as Matteo has introduced, that's one of the factors that is important for the development of CDC1s. And we have several different indications that the phenotype that we saw in, CD, in beta 3 deficient mice is only in part due to problems in CDC1 development, but may also be a combined effect by, um, by T cell intrinsic function of beta 3 in CD8 T cells. All right, so. What about beta 3 expression in CD8 T cells? So here is an in vitro assay where we activated T cells in vitro, as I said, CD8 T cells and looked at beta 3 expression over time. And you see it kind of peaks at around two days um, after activation. In vivo, and here we, we reanalyzed some data from Kurt et al, single cell data on CD8 T cells in the context of LCNV infection. And here, you can see that's how the single cells develop over time. So here day three, day four, the five, six, and seven. And if you now overlay beta three expression, you can see that it peaks very distinctly between day three and four, and then it's gone. So it's a, it's a brief transient expression of beta three, and then it will never reappear until the memory response. But this is quite interesting. So we decided to, to, uh, to generate knockout OT1 T cells, and we did a 50-50 transfer with white top T cells, put them into mice, infected them with MOVA or vaccinia virus, and looked at their abundance. And as you can see in the primary phase, there's no difference. By contrast, when we now recall those mice in heterologous system, either prime with LM or vaccinia or vice versa, we now found that the wild type T cells dramatically outcompeted the knockout population. So what could be the reason for this? As you know, uh, T cells don't um, represent a homogeneous population, but they differentiate and actually represent the whole spectrum of different cells. And this is particularly obvious at, at, at the peak of response around day eight. We have many effector cells, we have um, more memory precursor cells, and over the time the effector cells contract and we have, we're left with a memory population. And most of the transcription factors that have been described to be important for memory development actually shift the balance between effector and memory precursor differentiation. So we were wondering whether this balance, and this can be, um, and here these are two markers, KLIG1 and R7 receptor, this indicate uh, these, um, the spectrum of differentiation, whether this balance could be inf influenced by beta 3. So we looked at this, and here's the result. Here we look at wild type, and here at knockout T cells, and you can see that there's actually no difference. And I thought this is really exciting because now we have a transcription factor that determines memory, but does not impact the, the, the differentiation of the T cells. So how is beta 3 important? How does it regulate memory T cell function? It turned out when we do a kinetic now here in the blood, that while in day seven, the abundance of knockout and wild type T cells was very similar. Over time, when T cells co uh, contracted, this contraction was much more severe within the beta 3 knockout T cells than in the wild type T cells. Here's just another way to show this looking at in the spleen, after listeria infection, or vaccinia infection. Importantly, when we took now these T cells, the knockout and the wild type at this time point, and, um, and sorted them and put equal numbers into a new mouse and then re challenged, again, the knockout T cells were not as efficient as the wild type T cells to re-expand, meaning that they not only have a problem in the contraction phase, but also the, the remaining memory T cells have a lower quality with regard to recall expansion as compared to the wild type counterparts. So two effects. Okay, so what's the basis for this? In part, this is dependent on changes in homeostatic proliferation. In particular, we're looking here at day 12 in the contraction phase, 
in KS6 to 7, we found a lower fraction of better 3 knockout T cells that still express KS6 to 7, indicative for changes in proliferation. More importantly, and we think that's the main function, we saw differences in the expression of BIM, a pro-apoptotic factor that regulates the survival of CD8 T cells. And as you can see, while the wild type T cells downregulate BIM over time, and particularly in the contraction phase, the knockout T cells were unable to do so efficiently, and they had much higher levels throughout uh, um, the time course when we looked at BIM expression. Now, this was in fact a critical factor for the function of beta F3 because when we knocked out BIM, knocked down BIM in the beta F3 deficient T cells, we could completely rescue the phenotype of beta F3 knockout T cells. So, this seemed to be really the functionally relevant um, mechanism that explained the differences in contraction between knockout and wild type T cells. Now, um, this is very interesting, we thought, but how could you make use of this? And so we thought maybe it's not only that T cells have a problem when they don't have beta 3, but maybe beta 3 could be also um, provide T cells with a benefit. So we decided to overexpress beta 3 in, in T cells with a retroviral vector. And as you can see, also in vitro, beta 3 overexpression now, now led to the downregulation of BIM. So cells that overexpressed beta 3 had lower expression of BIM. And as a consequence, when we transferred beta 3 overexpressing T cells together with empty vector T cells, transduced T cells, we found that the overexpressing T cells would now outcompete the control T cells over time after in vivo after infection. Now, what I thought was uh, quite exciting is that this not only works in murine T cells and in mouse, in mice in vivo, but it also works at least in vitro with human PBMCs. So beta 3 would give them a survival benefit in vitro. And we're currently testing whether we could use also this approach to enhance CAR T cells and apply them in vivo for immuno immunotherapy. All right, so uh, let me summarize this. So what we know is beta 3, although it's expressed very early, does not impact on the initial expansion of CD8 T cells, nor the differentiation, but it's important to regulate the contraction phase. And in the absence of beta 3, BIM is dysregulated, it remains high, causes cell death, and we result in a lower memory response that is also uh, um, qualitatively different on a single cell, on a per cell level. By contrast, if we overexpress beta 3, we again see no differences in differentiation, but we see changes in BIM, downregulation, and as a consequence, um, a more mild contracture phase and with ending up with more memory. And hopefully this also will translate into a better, better efficiency in the clinic. All right, so um, now I would, would be happy to share some of um, our unpublished results. And this is about not T cells now, not in not CD8 T cells, not conver uh, conventional T cells, but in fact about invariant T cells. So this guy Marco, my my, uh, my previous postdoc, you already know, and uh, this and he teamed up with two very talented um, PhD students in my lab, Paulina and Conrad. All right, um, we've talked so far about the biology of individual cells, right? how they find their partner and how they're distinct. This is in contrast to what we know of cells that act as a group. And here's a movie I took from, from Tim Lemmerman. And uh, we're looking at neutrophils that respond to uh, sterile damage in the skin in red and macrophages in green. And although these are two different cell types and they have different behavior, both of the cell types within uh, their group have a group behavior, right? All the neutrophils come together and then we see a second layer of macrophages. Now on the right side, you see another example of this, of a group behavior. And we were very excited about this movie because this is not looking at myeloid cells, but in fact, here we're looking at invariant T cells. So group behavior of T cells. And we thought this is really something we would like to understand better and particularly on a conceptual level. So what are invariant T cells? Invariant T cells consist primarily of three major lineages, 
gamma delta T cells, NK T cells, and May T cells. These lineages are different by the TCR they use, and also different with regards to uh, the restriction molecules that they are selected for. So NK T cells are stimulated in the context of CD1D molecules, and May T cells are stimulated in the context of MR1 molecules. Um, the NK T cells can be grouped as part of the innate immune system because they can be activated by cytokines, like cytokines from the L1 family member, um, and then, then they themselves produce cytokines, very similar to ILCs. But you can also group them as part of the adaptive immune system because of their TCR and because of their responses that are dependent on the TCR activation. Invariant T cells develop in the thymus, like conventional T cells, but they also differentiate in the thymus. And then as fully matured effector cells, they leave the thymus and seed the tissues. This is in contrast to conventional T cells that leave the thymus as a naive state. And only when they activate it in the lymph node, they will differentiate and then seed the tissue. Now to make things even more complicated, we also find invariant T cells in secondary lymphoid organs like the spleen or lymph nodes. And currently it's unclear how these different populations are connected, functionally and developmentally. All right, so we had the following idea. Based on the group behavior that we've seen in the, in the movies, we thought maybe we shouldn't think of these cells as distinct lineages, um, but rather we should think of them as a functional unit. And what do you mean with a functional unit? First, I mean that they share a physical space and they share a function. And this means that they have a shared homeostatic input, so cytokines and survival factors that define the size of the niche. And they have a shared function output that could be cytokines that are important for the function as a unit, but not as a single elements. This could be for pathogen control or healing. So uh, we wanted to test this idea and we started out to test this idea in the lymph node. And we, and we did this because we already knew from our previous work that the invariant T cells in the lymph node, they are living in very distinct areas. That is the subcapsule sinus and the interfollicular area. So we kind of have already defined the space in which we uh, could look for that function niche. And once you know that cells share a specific space in the tissue, you can also now look for them based on their specific adhesion molecule expression, chemokinoceptor expression, because this is at the end what defines the localization. So we did this. So here we look at the inguinal lymph node. Here we gave them CD3 T cells. Um, and here are the one, two chemokinoceptors and two integrant pair, but you can use others. Now we can look at this population. And as I, I told you before, or as, as I'm telling you now, is, is basically this population that seems to be homogeneous with regards to these adhesion molecules, they are in fact consisted of different populations with regard to the ontogeny, with regard to the lineage. So it's gamma delta T cells, mate and CD1 T cells that are part of this, um, of this group of cells. Now, are they really homogeneous? In order to understand this, we applied single cell transcriptomics. And here we put a bit of a larger gate so we can include more cells and have a more unbiased view. And here you see different populations, LC, CD4 T cells, CD8 T cells, and this group of cells are invariant T cells. And you could now think, yeah, maybe that's gamma delta and mate and CD and, and, and KT cells, but this turned out not to be the case. In, in, by contrast, in, within every cluster, we, fought, we found T cells from every lineage. So this cluster contains gamma delta, NKT, and mate in this cluster as well. All right, so, um, so once we have defined now the niche, we can look at it and we can also ask now, what's the consequence when we look at mice that lack gamma delta T cells or NKT cells? And the first thing we found is that the size of the niche actually doesn't change. Here's just a quantification. Certainly what is changing is the composition of the niche. So in the wild type mice uh, and in gamma delta, we see a different composition of the single elements based on their, on, on their lineage, but the size doesn't change. So does the function change? So in order to address this, we infected mice um, in the foot pet with Staphylococcus, And then a couple of hours later, we looked at the cytokine response by those invariant T cells in the lymph node. 
And this is what you can see here, looking at L17F and A, and we can see a very rapid production of cytokines four hours after in context of this infection. Now, this response is completely dependent on cytokines, because if we look at 23 receptor knockout cells, we don't see any cytokine production by those invariant T cells. Importantly, when we look at the single knockouts, this cytokine production was unaltered. It was only gone when we looked at the receptor knockouts. Still, the cytokine production is functionally very relevant because when we look at knockout mice, we see a dramatically increased bacterial load. So these invariant T cells function together to limit bacterial growth in the lymph node and in the tissue. All right, so what, so what do we learn from this? We, we were quite convinced at this point that these functional units exist. And now we ask, once you know these functional units, how do they look like in different tissues? Because you have, we have a different way to look at the cells as a unit instead of its single elements. So the first thing we looked at was the mesenteric lymph node. And to our surprise, the whole unit was absent. The same was true in the spleen. And now this could be due to several um, possibilities. One is that there's some intrinsic differences between those lymph nodes. And the other uh, possibility is that this is not a function of the lymph node, but a function of the tissue that it drinks. So we collaborated and, and asked Jochen and Mengi to, uh, to help us with this question. And Mengi transplanted the mesoteric lymph node into the popliteal fossa. And then after a few weeks, the lymphatics would reconnect and now we can analyze them. And what we found is, as we know, the endogenous lymph node has this niche. The endogenous mesenteric lymph node doesn't have the niche, but the transplanted mesenteric lymph node now in the popliteal fossa now again has the niche, arguing that the cells are in the lymph node because they're coming from the tissue. And this is what we have validated with very different systems. And now I want to show you one experiment that I, I find quite exciting because it turned out that this is not only true for our 17 producing T cells that come from the skin, but in fact, it's true for all invariant T cells with any differentiation state from all tissues with the exception of intraepithelial lymphocytes. Okay, now here's the experiment. We collected metastinal lymph node, mesenteric lymph node, and inguinal lymph node, and sorted now all invariant T cell subsets, hashtag them with an antibody with a DNA tag, mix them, and then run single cell RNA sequencing. And here's what we found. The algorithm finds two major cluster, many different subsets, but two major cluster. And by the one way, none of these cluster is representative of any invariant T cell lineage, like gamma delta T cells or so. All clusters are mixed between the different lineages. The important delineator between these two major groups is in fact CD62L. And this is because these cells are all recirculating invariant T cells, and these cells are all invariant T cells that migrated from the tissues to their draining lymph nodes. Now, if we overlay the origin of these cells, inguinal metastinal mesenteric lymph node, you can find that all the cells that are part of the recirculating population, they're equally mixed, as you would expect. But all the cells that come from the tissue, they are completely different. They're different in composition and also different in their transcriptional identity. And here's just a statistical analysis. So here we're looking at the blood-derived cells and here we're looking at the lymph-derived cells. So you can really see that every lymph node has quite a different composition of these cells. Now, these lymph-derived cells, as I uh, initially um, told you, are fully, um, uh, fully um, equipped effector cells. So once you activate them, they are ready to go to make cytokines in a cytokine-dependent manner. Now, the question is, if this is the case and every lymph node has a different composition of invariant T cells that may be Th1, Th2, or Th17 polarized, what's now the consequence uh, with regard to immune response? So we made single cell suspensions and activated all lymph node cells with PMAONO and did an uh, ELISA and checked what cytokines are being produced by the different lymph nodes. And as you can see, the lymph nodes between, among each other have a quite different uh, pattern of cytokines that they produce. For example, um, the metastinal lymph node has a strong propensity to make um, IL-4, 
and, and GMCSF17 is also very prominent in the inguinal lymph node. And we see differences in different gamma. Now in different gamma, these differences are not dependent on invariant T cells, but are primarily produced by NK cells and CD8 T cells. Uh, these differences are indeed based on differences in invariant T cells. So every, as a conclusion, every lymph node makes a different innate immune response. Okay, what I've been showing you so far is a cytokine mediated activation. And this basically depends typically on, or this depends on the activation of two cytokines. At one point we need uh, one family cytokines like R1 beta or R18, and then we need additional cytokines like in this case R23, and then the invariant T cells will produce R17. But there's also a different mode of activation. So these are shared functions as I've shown you. There's also a different mode of activation and that's TCR mediated activation the ligation of the specific T cell receptor. And this is obviously a function that could be unique and different between different lineages of invariant T cells. And I've shown you that this function is now represented by the tissue derived invariant T cells. While this function we speculated could be uh, represented by the recirculating population. So we looked at different infections to, to find uh, a situation where we really see a TCR dependent activation of invariant T cells. And what we found is based on some published studies is Staph aureus infection. And if we do Staph aureus infection in the skin again, and now wait three days, we found a very specific and strong proliferation of invariant T cells. And in particular, this is gamma delta T cells that express the V gamma 4 chain. And if we look at gamma delta T cell knockout mice, we don't see an expansion of these cells. So we're really convinced that these cells are activated in a TCR specific manner. And indeed, when we look at R23 receptor knockouts, these T cells still expand. So it's really TCR specific response. Now, as I said, we speculated that this response is now driven by the recirculating population. And as a result, you would be able to activate these cells no matter which route you infect. But this is indeed not the case. So it turned out that also these cells were in fact derived from the tissue and specifically from the skin. So when we infected the lung, another clinically relevant route for Staph aureus infection, we did not see this expansion of these gamma delta T cells. Also not when we increased the dose tenfold, when we waited long, longer, or when we did repeat in, um, infections. So it really seems that this response is very hardwired to the tissue. All right, so let me summarize what we think is happening. Um, we think that we should change our view of the different lineages of invariant T cells to not look at them separately, but to think of them as a functional unit. We have tested this idea in the lymph node and we found evidence that this is indeed the case, but it's also the case in the skin. And this is true because the skin invariant T cells are directly connected to the one in the drain lymph node because they constantly migrate from the skin to the draining lymph node. Now, this is not only a function of the skin and the cutaneous lymph node, but it's true for every tissue. And, and since every tissue has a different composition of invariant T cells, just as well, because they migrate to their respective brain lymph nodes, every lymph node has a unique composition of invariant T cells. And the consequence is this, that upon infection or vaccination, Every lymph node will not only make a cytokine mediated specific activation pattern, but also TCR specific um, um, activation pattern. So you will get different immune responses depending on which route you infect. And this is because of the invariant T cells. So we think this is um, quite exciting and it will certainly have um, major impacts if you think about vaccination, in particular, those strategies that um, aim at targeting these cells. So I want to um, end my presentation by thanking my lab members. It's really, I feel very fortunate to work with so dedicated and, um, and very smart people. And very, you know, that's really, I think I'm really fortunate to do that. And I um, also want to thank um, our collaborators. And I want to quickly highlight again, the people who have been contributing to this work. Now I have two more slides I would like to share. One I would like to say that Würzburg is actually a very nice city. It's in the center of Germany and uh, it's a mid-sized university city. It's very family friendly. You can reach everything by bicycle. 
But it's not only a nice place to, to live, it's also a nice place to do research because there's a lot of very exciting centers around us that we interact with, ranging from RNA-based infection research, artificial intelligence, and all these clinical centers that we can interact with. Now, why am I telling you this? Is because also our institute is growing and we have uh, two positions available, one for full professor and for a junior PI. So stay tuned for these, uh, for these um, positions to be posted or if you're interested, just directly contact me. So thank you very much for listening. It was a big pleasure and um, see you soon. Yeah, thank you so much, Wolfgang, for a fascinating talk. And I'm sure <clears throat> there are a lot of questions uh, for you. So let me uh, hand it over to Carla, who can remind you how to ask questions to Wolfgang. Yes, thank you, Wolfgang. That was great. Thanks for sharing your findings and your thinking about this individual versus collective type of uh, behaviors. Uh, so you should be able to find a Twitter, um, in Twitter, sorry, you should be able to find this tweet that says, ask questions for Dr. Wolfgang Kastermüller here. So please reply to that tweet with your question and do not forget to mention the hashtag global immuno and the account that Wolfgang will be using today. So thanks everybody for joining us today and we look forward to reconnecting next Wednesday and for our global immuno colleagues across the world on the other side in um, the world in, in Asia, in Australia, you will be able to join earlier next uh, Wednesday, but we will be here again at the same time, uh, you know, as every week. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.